Hello, Recursive community. Our next guest comes all the way from London and has very special interest in Central and Eastern Europe. Bakrom Ibrahimov is partner at Molten Ventures, which invests in Europe's tech leaders from Series A to growth stage. Bakrom joined Molten in 2022 from EBRD Venture Capital, where he founded and managed commitments of over 500 million euros over three VC funds. Previously, Bakrom was leading investments with the Virgin Green Fund and TLCom Capital. He was also an internet finance director at Virgin Media and tech investment baker with uh, Cohen and Co. and Credit Suisse. Bakrom holds a degree from London School of Economics, Cambridge University, and Tashkent State uh, Technical University. Bakrom, welcome to the Recursive Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I want to bring you back in time when mm. you started your career um, as a. I, would it be correct to say technology investment banker? <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, what sparked your love for technology and uh, eventually led you to this field of uh, of work? Uh, yes, I kind of I started my career um, in tech investment banking. Um, spent kind of that was the early early kind of training years. Spent spent two years in the investment banking, doing specifically technology sector. And I guess on your question, why why technology? It's uh, it's something that I was always uh, always, always interested. I uh, although I cannot tell the story, the usual story that you know, I have a computer from five, I had a computer from five year old, and so was coding since then. Mm -hmm. It's actually you know I was born and raised in uh, former Soviet Union country, Uzbekistan, and uh, the first time I uh, had access to a computer was late. Late, late school years. But from very early years, I was very interested in math, physics, sciences. My, my parents they were in um, sciences and physics and chemistry. And I myself kind of spent uh, actually my school years in the math and uh, physics um, concentration school. Mm -hmm. And then started my bachelor degree first in engineering and then moved to the moved to economics. So kind of I was always interested in you know, sciences, tech, And uh, during the kind of my 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 teenage years, during the teenage years, Soviet Union broke down, mm. and the central funding from Moscow for science has ceased. So at that point in time, I needed to divert my attention to the economics area, but uh, I tried always to balance this, make sure the uh, sciences, technology interests, and the economics. And that's why I kind of I pursued the career. Started started my uh, started my career as, uh, in the combination of finance and technology. Can you tell me maybe uh, which were the most exciting tech innovations at this time when you when you started your career? In the yeah, it was actually uh, it was Internet 1.0. Actually, it was yeah. you know it was ninety nine two thousand, and actually the tech the first tech bubble just uh, burst right. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the companies were going bankrupt, but at the same time, a lot of internet companies, but at the same time, a lot of the kind of today brand names, they were just, you know, accelerating their growth and uh, uh, kind of proving their, proving their place in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure that these were also very, very exciting times. Um, what, how did you grow then later on an appetite for the startup world and also for venture capital? What led you there? I in, in tech investment banking, in those couple of years, I worked a lot with the uh, startups, uh, okay. kind of with, with tech startups, and as well as you know, after after my uh, after my tech um, investment banking years, I went to work for uh, internet internet company, uh, Virgin Media. They used to be called um, NTL at that point in time. And I was a finance director for the internet division. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, uh, kind of that was again early 2000, mm -hmm. uh, internet bandwidth, just the internet connection bandwidth was very scarce. And it's actually, it was scarce, scarce, scarce asset. And what I spent a lot of time is understanding the economics of the telecom networks, right? Understanding the bandwidth demand, bandwidth consumption. What are the consumers actually using the internet? Because we're kind of trying to predict the capacity capacity of those networks, and spend a lot of time looking looking at the consumer behavior, um, 
trying to predict kind of the the bandwidth consumption and you know how much needs to be invested in the in the telco uh, infrastructure and that's why I spent a lot of time researching new 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 applications and uh, learning about tech 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 companies and um, after that experience made made a transition to venture capital mm-hmm. I think it's fascinating that you have been observing, you know, these trends, trends developing from the burst of the first internet bubble. And now we are again in a period of major transformation. Uh, do you see any similarities between these two transitions, you know, um, you know, internet 1.0 and now we're in the middle of <laughs> the next one? Uh, are they patterns which are repeating or... Um, yeah what what how would you evaluate you know mm. this uh, this transition that is happening now knowing what happened in the first yeah. one i think we are we are in the uh, in the in the downturns kind of right now in the kind mm. of tech tech downturn uh, i think uh, kind of the response of the companies and the environment that the companies are facing they are similar but at the same time very different right so mm-hmm. so the the downturn during the first the first tech bubble burst in 2000 was uh was not accompanied by microeconomic uh turmoil right mm. so what we're seeing today is actually is a bit unique because we have asset pricing correction across all of the all of the industries right so the the high inflation uh, caused much higher interest rates, yeah. and that's high interest rates. Obviously, they impact the valuations for all the assets, but specifically for the technology sector because technology has a kind of technology cash loss. Technology assets they have much longer lived, uh, uh, much higher kind of much longer lived expectations on the cash flow generation. Mm-hmm. That's why they're most impacted. So. Um, I think what caused right now the, uh, the slowdown in the tech sector mm-hmm. is very different, but the environment that companies face is similar because I mean this is again an environment where the um, companies which were struggling proving their business model they would suffer most, mm-hmm. and uh, this is an environment where a lot of the companies they need to prove to prove their uh, business model to prove their kind of use cases in the market and really focus on uh, on building sustainable business not just a growth mm-hmm. and would you say that um, this is also something that will affect founders in central and eastern europe definitely yes yeah. definitely i mean it it, invest, it it impacts founders elsewhere i think though kind of my opinion maybe biased that's what kind of that's the region where i'm looking after mm-hmm. i think uh, Founders in Central Eastern Europe, they have been on a relative basis, they've, they've been always uh, more frugal, right? So more frugal in terms of the use of capital, more product, product focused, right? And I think that's, uh, these are the elements really which, piece, which should pay it off in the current environment. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, so you became part of Molten at the, yeah, last year, not so long ago, um, but I wondered, in general, what is the mission of Moulton? What is the impact that you want to have on the technology world and also the value that you're bringing to to your shareholders? Because Moulton is also one of the, it's actually the largest publicly um, uh, traded uh, VC fund, I think, operating in, in the whole world, right? It's one of the larger funds, yes, in Europe. Yeah, in yeah. Europe. Okay. <clears throat> so... Yeah, so- what is your mission? How do you create value? What is the impact that you want to leave? Yeah, what what do we do? We back we back entrepreneurs to build category defining uh, businesses, category mm. defining uh, uh, leading businesses, and uh, we support entrepreneurs in, uh, in 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 kind of providing financing, but also helping them with their day to day kind of key uh, key decision making, strategic decision making, so mm. trying to be a partner partner, trust, trusted partner, both in the good times and the bad times. And at the same time, kind of really focusing on building sustainable businesses, supporting uh, sustainable businesses, which basically means as well, uh, for us, e- ESG is very important, right? So okay. environmental, social and governance aspects are very important. That's something that we work closely with the 
portfolio companies again with a view because we're not just uh, we're not just here to you know to invest in companies and take exit them as soon as possible but we are we what we ultimately want to do is build sustainable businesses sustainable successes mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and how do you evaluate the potential of Central and Eastern Europe why is this region becoming uh, you know of special interest to you now mm -hmm. we also have uh, you as someone who is uh, would be responsible for that region uh, more or less the go-to person for founders who might be interested in working with Molten what did you see over the past let's say 10 years happening in Central and Eastern Europe I think the uh What's interesting about this, about Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe region, and you know, one way to look at it at the very high level is, if you were to look, kind of where the largest number of developers, right, globally. Mm -hmm. So the countries would be you know, U.S., China, India. These are the countries which has the highest number of developers globally. However, if you were to look at the number of developers per dollar GDP. Mm -hmm. and rank every country in the world, right? What you'll notice is that the top 20 countries, they're all Eastern European. Wow. So basically okay. what it basically says that you have high concentration of uh, developed uh, kind of engineering talent focused in small economies. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that this is a blessing. This is a blessing that, that uh, entrepreneurs find themselves in small economies because from day one, uh, from day one, entrepreneurs in Eastern Europe, they have to think about global market. Mm -hmm. They have to be, uh, they have to think about being competitive on the global market, how to, how to go after the global market. They don't have, uh, you know, advantage uh, like US, uh, US entrepreneurs being in the, uh, being located in the homogeneous largest market. So that, that basically global perspective, that's actually, I think, find, I find most, most interesting in Eastern Europe because ultimately what we're trying to do, we're trying to find outliers, outliers on a global scale, companies that make a difference, not just at a country level, but com companies that make a difference at, at, uh, in the markets that they operate on a mm. global scale. And why, how, how is this now different than uh, in terms of your strategy for Central and Eastern Europe than before? You have already made the investments in our region. Yes, what actually, is the, what is what is new now? Okay. I think it's uh, you kind of you know a lot of uh, yes, Molton has made a number of investments in in um, in the region. And actually, a lot of success cases that uh, Molton has had, they have some roots in uh, Central Eastern Europe companies like uh, uh, you know Transferwise, Revolut, uh, UiPath, uh, Peak Games, uh, you know more recent FinTech OS, Realize, right? Mm. So a, lo a lot of the actual investments that Molton has made, they have roots in Eastern Europe, and that's exactly basically why we want to we want to double down on the region. That's mm -hmm. uh, you know this is we see that uh, you know this you know, actually if you look at the number of success cases coming out of Eastern Europe, it's been accelerating. And uh, we indeed seeing a slowdown in the in the venture capital industry globally, Europe specifically. Mm -hmm. But the slowdown is less so in specifically Eastern Europe. Okay. The other also the also the other also dynamic that we see relative to other markets, right? Okay. We see a lack of the uh, lack of financing post the seed stage. So actually, what we see today is that in many Eastern European uh, Eastern European countries, Bulgaria including, mm -hmm. uh, there is actually today a very healthy ecosystem of seed stage investors. True, and they mm -hmm. have been really kind of supported by local governments, local efforts to uh, really catalyze grassroots innovation, which has been very uh, very helpful. The EIF, EBRD as well. Yes, yeah. indeed mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, but to much less extent the financing beyond the seat, right? Actually, where you help the companies really scale their sales channels, mm -hmm. right? Really accelerate product development, product development cycle. Um, so that actually has been much less, what we see is much less, much less in Eastern Europe, including some of the kind of, some of the other funds, some of our peers, very few people actually have dedicated, dedicated efforts, uh, mm -hmm. kind of scouting actively. I mean, everybody invests in, in companies out of Eastern Europe, but uh, kind of uh, very few, if any, uh, have dedicated resources specifically on, the, on a consistent basis scouting that region. And that's what we see, that's what, that's what we want to capitalize, both mm -hmm. kind of the, the um, uh, the helping the very tech folks, product folks, founders going after the global, 
global uh, global market opportunity, and at the same time capitalizing this funding gap, funding gap between the uh, between the seed stage and the growth equity stage. So mm-hmm. at the growth equity, actually, you know, uh, big funds they would invest in any company, but really helping you know helping and bringing that best best practice perspective, how to how to scale sales, how to how to build a team. That's something that we want to actually double down on. Mm-hmm. I think it's not an accident that uh, exactly the stage is called the uh, valley of death. <laughs> so I wonder, uh, you know, next to capital, what kind of expertise can you bring into a company um, from on the side of Molten? I guess you, I guess it's a question of investment strategy, uh, but what is the relationship that uh, you're building with uh, the founding team exactly on this stage? Are you investing and then you move away or do you somehow support them um, also in the management decisions and uh, how to scale the operations, uh, you know, all those tricky parts of uh, scaling a business? We, yes, we, um, we, uh, we help companies really to, uh, for them to address strategic decisions, right? So mm. we're not actually, we always take minority positions Okay. We always really focus on that the founders are in the driving seat, right? They are mm-hmm. actually, they are the largest shareholders. That's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see that they, they, run the, they run the business and that's what we are supporting. We actually, when we invest for us, kind of really appraising the management team is at the core what we do. At the same time, for the strategic decisions where we can c- kind of help, that's that's these are the um, these are the areas that we focus on. Mm-hmm. So we've been, we have a we have a very rich investment experience, and we've seen we've seen a number of a number of different circumstances, a number of different you know uh, s- structures, and we know how to, how to you know what are the real best practice K- KPIs are, mm-hmm. and that's something that we uh, we try to help the founders really mm-hmm. kind of tackle tackle the next stage. And uh, be with them. Uh, you know, not, 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 there are no there are no cases which only success, right? There is always bumpy road, mm. and be with them uh, both in a kind of in a in a bad times and good times. Uh, uh, be trusted partner. Mm. I <clears throat> often speak to founders about their relationship to their investors, uh, and of course, in the different stages is different. Uh, it depends also from one investor to another one. If it's an angel investment or VC investment, you know, there are all these aspects. But I hear also most of the investors uh, speaking about the coachability of founders. And um, I wonder for those who are maybe in the early stage and who would like to work with you, uh, how can you maybe give us a bit of an insight? How is this dynamics changing from, um, you know, seed stage to, let's say, post series A, um, how is this relationship changing? What is the, how is the dynamics different between an investor and a founder? I would say that, you know, once, uh, once you kind of raise large amount of capital, mm. obviously the decisions have bigger consequences, right? Mm. So, you know, decisions have bigger consequences. And some decisions are kind of reversible, others are non-reversible, others can, you know, <laughs> can compound into big issues. So indeed, kind of with the, uh, with the larger capital, I think comes, comes more responsibility. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's, I think that's why really important to have, uh, to have the right, uh, the right investors, right? Mm. Uh, but at the same time, I think what is really important, I mean, everybody talks about the value add, right? Everybody, yeah. all the investors talk about, you know, they bring this value, not they bring all. that value. Some of them prefer but, not to. Uh, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah. to my mind, the value add comes with the right mentality, right? The mm-hmm. many, meaning that actually the, the philosophy that we have and uh, the uh, kind of the, our approach is we serve entrepreneurs, right? Mm-hmm. So we actually, we, entrepreneurs is one of our customers. The other customer is being our, our fund investors. So we serve investors, we serve entrepreneurs, and we're not to dictate, you know, how to run the businesses and kind of uh, imp- impose our our way of doing things. But really, uh, helping uh, founders uh, tackle the major major challenges and mostly tackle them by questioning, by, you know, by actually questioning uh, in terms of. Uh, helping the founders to consider a number of different avenues, helping mm-hmm. the founders to consider 
different options and uh, kind of more letting letting the founder choose how they want to achieve their their own vision, not our vision. <laughs> yeah, the vision is, I guess, uh, always with the founder. Um, good, but. Let's come to the to the other question. What are you looking at in a founding team before you invest? Of course, at the Series A organization will be a bit bigger. They would be also having substantial revenue. Um, what else would you be looking? at? I would think that you know the um, substantial revenue is actually is rare at Series A. Okay. So that's not something that we focus on. I mean, the the one thing that. Uh, we focus at Series A specifically is really backing the founders who are uh, who are addressing large markets, large markets, imminent markets, mm-hmm. uh, imminent for change markets, and founders who really uh, intimately know the markets, right? So really, kind of my oftentimes the first question is actually is uh, you know why do you want to do this, right? What is exactly what is the relationship between uh, between yourself, between your background, and the problem that you're trying to address? And this is being because this. Uh, Intimate knowledge, so this enables uh, founders to have intimate knowledge. A eh? also enables them to have uh, resistance, re- kind of persistence. Uh, you know, it's 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 a, it's a bumpy road, it's a long-term road, and the founders need to be can really um, really resilient. Mm. Uh, you you don't want to back founders who are here just to you know make. Uh, May capital, mm. but you want to back founders who are uh, who want to change 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 the world, and that's uh, that's something that we're looking for. Uh, exceptional founders and uh, technology in terms of um, uh, how do they compete with the, in the market, mm. how do you differentiate themselves, uh, and as well as uh, go to market strategy, mm. how scalable it is. <clears throat> You know, when I was doing my research and I was reading exactly about this phrase that uh, uh, that you, I think you used in another uh, interview, you know, founders who have an intimate relationship to the market, I, I found it kind of, it made me smile. Uh, but maybe you can give uh, an example, you know, of uh, who would be a founder where you felt like, okay, this is uh, where we feel like, okay, this is the, you know, relationship that is necessary for a founding team to have in order to go through this roller coaster of mm. being, you know, <laughs> in a startup. No, I give you, you know, I give you one example. I mean, yeah. I invested in a company called Pixar. Today, they are the largest mobile photo editor globally, mm. right? Uh, they are out of Armenia, out of, uh, you know, all these European countries. Mm-hmm. And the founder, uh, Havanes, you know, he developed uh, the first version for his own daughter, right? So, he, oh, okay. he, so that's something that is mm-hmm. really, he felt passionate about, you know, put, uh, put a lot of effort and this is something that he that continues driving him is giving tools to um, to express themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it interesting uh, that you you yourself uh, were born and raised in in, in the uh, Soviet Union, uh, but then you have worked also with the European, but also with U.S. founders. And I wonder, are there any also any um, differences in the mindset that you have been observing? Um, you know, there has been a lot uh, said about the risk aversion of European founders and uh, that uh, we are not so tolerant to failure, that we don't have a healthy relationship to failure. Um, but what are other, you know, mindset differences that you have been observing between the founders, maybe we can segment it even more, you know, Western mm. European and Central and Eastern European. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think versus US, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, US, US founders, uh, they operate in the largest homogeneous market yeah. with the richest uh, kind of uh, tech ecosystem, right? Yeah. So I guess that's one of the reasons why the, uh, uh, that why there is you know more risk taking, mm-hmm. more focus to growth, but at the same time indeed there is more tolerance to more tolerance to failure. Right, mm-hmm. there is more tolerance to failure. There is a culture, uh, actually, that you know uh, benefiting from from failure experience. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a culture of uh, as well as you know. Uh, Really going, you know, being ma- maverick, right? So a lot mm-hmm. of the, a lot of the, actually a lot of the many success cases in the U.S. They started by, they were started by immigrants, right? Um, in uh, in Western Europe, I think uh, 
I think one is the ecosystem is much younger, mm-hmm. right? But it has, it has, I think it has grown a lot. I mean, I've come to this uh, s- s- sector in 2000, and since then, oh, okay. the Western European, <laughs> the Western European market has has grown a lot, and yeah. uh, it's it's changing substantially. And I believe, actually, you know, again, maybe bias, but the uh, the most interesting opportunities, uh, they they will continue coming out of the out of Europe, mm-hmm. uh, you know. What is the mi- mindset difference in Eastern Europe? I guess yes. I guess you know being more frugal, uh, being more frugal, and as well being very product driven. Mm. And it offers it offers advantages and disadvantages, right? On the dis- disadvantages, it's you know at times it is hard to uh, convince uh, you know founder you know let's let's hire this very expensive salesperson even mm. though you know his or her salary is you know multiple times higher than yours <laughs> right than CEO. we still need to we still need to build a sustainable sales effort uh, kind of this frugality sometimes uh, is is something that needs to be overcome but um, m- most of the time is actually it works um it works in favor because this real product focus is enables a lot of the Eastern European founders pursue what's called product-led strategy, product-led growth strategy, mm-hmm. which is trying to acquire and retain customers via product differentiation, not just uh, you know spending spending on marketing and uh, and sales, but actually using the product to itself mm-hmm. to acquire customers and retain customers. Mm-hmm. I sometimes feel like. Um Maybe this is valid only for the early stage that um, founders in our region have uh, like a glass ceiling of, uh, you know, when it comes to the ambitions for international growth. Um, Maybe because we don't have also that many role models and examples of um, startups which originate from from this region on who became then a global success now slowly we do have great examples like you that you invested in. Viva Wallet in Greece, we have um, you know, Payhook also, the first unicorn in Bulgaria. We see that more and more often. And still, this is uh, an observation made by local investors who say that uh, they would like to see more ambition uh, in, already in the early stage. Is it something that you see as well uh, when you hear founders pitching to you? Uh- I think um, I think I think you know the challenge is uh, I guess for East European founders is, is this that you know you really need to go after the global markets right so that's mm. that's it is uh, the threshold is quite it's quite high it is mm. I think again I see that as the as a benefit because we as we see so that's what we're looking for mm. we're looking for large outcomes but indeed we need to have more we need to have more success cases I do think that the kind of the best stimulus uh, you know a lot of the time when there are conferences or some other events when um, discussed what needs to be done to improve the uh, to improve the ecosystem a lot of the times you know kind of there are discussions about regulatory tax incentives right mm. which are important but I don't think that they are as uh, as catalytic as the success cases right so okay. if you look at the if you look at the you know the number of companies that came out from from Skype right it's mm. it's you know, there are dozens of those right um, Another great example, actually, very recent, is in Turkey, uh, Peak Games, right? Yeah. Peak Games, it's Turkey has, in a very short period of time, became the global hub for the mobile game developers. Mm-hmm. Just, just you know, capitalized by 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 key, Peak Games, that the the teams that came out of that. Uh, I think uh, Romania is becoming much more active since the UiPath. Uh, your path growth. So I think that's, these are the real, um, I think, uh, catalyzers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's well put actually. <clears throat> um, do you have a favorite question that you ask to founders when they pitch to you? <laughs> no, that's, you know, as, as I mentioned, my, my favorite question is this, is why do you actually, you know, what it is uh, that uh, relates you to, to this market? And, uh, uh, that's, that's something that I always ask. And, uh, mm. I also see how how engaging the founder is, you know, describing it. You know, to me, the most interesting question, actually, the back of my mind that I ask myself is, do I have the benefit of the doubt that actually I'm so much being engaged uh, that I would actually have a benefit of the doubt, drop everything what I'm doing, and actually join that entrepreneur to 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 work for him <laughs> or her to to follow that uh, to follow that uh, that vision? Yeah. 
do you wish you were sometimes on the other side? <laughs> well, it's, this is this is this is a question. This is a question: is you yeah. know, would I actually, you know, do I have this drive? And that uh, and that's I think that's important because that's as well how founders most of the time hire high talent for their mm-hmm. for their for their companies. Uh, I would like to reverse the question now. You know, given exactly the macroeconomic situations that we are currently in, um, it is a roller coaster for founders currently you know, to uh, navigate through all the crises that we are going through. I, I lost count of them. Uh, but what is the responsibility of the investor, especially you know after the Series A? How do you see your support in um, backing portfolio companies and helping them navigate through these difficult times as we hear? I guess it's not applicable for all of them. And not all of them are going through t- difficult times. Crisis can be also great for some industries, but especially for those who are currently going through a, a hard patch. Yes, we, you know, f- f- in those in those sort of circumstances, uh, obviously, the supporting the portfolio is number one priority for for most of the investors, for us mm. including. And we do we do help founders really uh, kind of trying to focus them on uh, on thinking uh, kind of. We, you may call it more realistically about the environment where we are mm-hmm. uh, taking taking decisions. Uh, oftentimes, it involves uh, you know reducing cost base, uh, difficult making those difficult decisions for the long term success of the business, and uh, mm-hmm. indeed uh, as well as assuring that uh, you know where where we can, where it makes sense, that we will provide. Uh, provide kind of financial support as well in these difficult times. Mm-hmm. I think what is really important is the communication, right? Communication, really transparency with the founders at those times is is really important. That uh, um, you know, I remember, for example, coronavirus situation that was the same, right? And yeah. um, a number of companies actually at that point in time, I, I had some of the portfolio companies in another fund in the travel industry, for example, right? Mm. And uh, the travel at that point in time stopped completely, right? And uh, there was actually uh, two portfolio companies in travel. And, you know, to one of them, I said, look, there is a difficult time. We're going to go through the through this period uh, where you would have, have no, you know, no revenue. But uh, we really believe what you've been doing. You've been consistently executing and we will support you from that period. So you really need to focus on really, you know, in this environment, maybe invest more in the product development so we come up stronger out of that, right? Mm-hmm. And to another business, unfortunately, which has been struggling even before that, uh, it's really important to communicate upfront uh, that we will not be able to will not be able to provide this uh, this support, right? We've been, you've been struggling. We had a lot of a lot of you know uh, a lot of issues, and you know we will not be able to to support you through that period. And mm. uh, being uh, being open and uh, timely in terms of the feedback uh, and kind of uh, our position, it is it is very critical. Mm. Do you have um, like a no go scenario in the? relationship with a father where you say okay this is just uh, this is not going to work out um, you know a reaction from their side or a situation where you felt okay um, this is not with our principles or values or whatever sure yeah I mean yeah. obviously I mean, there are those circumstances happen they're not um, they're not that rare right and they mm-hmm. may happen due to a number of uh, number of circumstances mm-hmm. both in terms of the uh, well to rare extent some some principles of how doing businesses but more often in terms of you know we as well we have we have two two types of customers the, the entrepreneurs and also our our fund investors right that mm-hmm. we need to make sure that we uh, really uh, produce economic economic results and uh, <laughs> we need to s- support businesses that we kind of believe will be successful in the longer term. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm thinking that uh, exactly in the stage where you're investing, you're probably also um, nurturing a lot of relationships to the early stage funds. Um, and VCs sometimes do not talk too much <laughs> or do not talk very transparently with each other. But what would be the precondition for you to work well with uh, with an early stage fund from uh, Central and Eastern Europe? I think the uh, the key um, 
the key condition condition is that uh, we have the same that everybody around the table right so mm. all the old investors uh, we have the same agenda we have okay. the same agenda and the agenda is uh, agenda is, is to to help founders build a, build a big business right mm-hmm. and it is and as well as making sure that everybody as well all the investors are really uh, with the mindset that this is a, this is a founder's business right mm-hmm. that we're not here to uh, pursue every time our kind of own interest but we are here uh, to to help to help the founders build build big, big business and that's 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 a focus mm. but isn't it like that like um, there are two levels of, of doing business when you invest uh, venture capital you know on the one side there is the company's business but on the other side there is also the business between the VC funds uh, I, I wonder sometimes if you know the two businesses are not going too much away from each other if they're not going astray. <laughs> Do you yeah, feel there like are, that? There are, there, are, yeah. there, are, there are circumstances because every investor, they have their own, yeah, they have their own circumstances. You know, yeah. some investors may be approaching end of their life, you know, fund to fund life. Some investors may not have capital to support the business for, further. Mm. So uh, there, are, there are those circumstances, but I think, uh, Uh, that happens, but not that often because uh, venture capital is, it is a very long term game, right? So it's a very long term. Uh, the the impact the impact from the investing is a very long term, and I think uh, mostly uh, really investors try to be reasonable and act as act uh, you know uh, with the in mind with their long term long term standing in the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, lately has been a lot of discussion due to what we see happening also in the States. Uh, you know, for the first time we have founders who have been charged uh, with sentences for <laughs> defrauding their their investors for not being ethical on how they operate, how they do business. Um, I think, you know, I, I wonder what is happening on a systemic level maybe in the US where we in Europe could actually learn. Um, although we are catching up, we're mm-hmm. still slower in the development uh, as, as, as the US. US is still, when it comes to venture capital, the, also the biggest market. Yes, I mean, those, those cases as well happen, happen in Europe. I mean, they are less public because the magnitude probably has been smaller. Mm. Uh, but uh, those cases has happened, and as well as yes, in many cases this is also a reflection of the shortcomings of what the investors have been doing, yeah. both during the diligence phase and also uh, to during the during the portfolio kind of dur- during the time when they were mm-hmm. working with the uh, with the companies. Actually, a number of those cases, uh, some of the investors never took board seats and uh, kind of were relying <laughs> entirely on the founders to 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 drive the business. Yeah, true. Um, <clears throat> so I think there is no doubt that uh, Central and Eastern Europea, uh, European founders excel when it comes to uh, focus on the product, to engineering uh, talents. But somehow, I think we're still missing long traditions when it comes to sales, to marketing, um, also maybe to um, management. Um, is this an observation that uh, you can you would share, I think, especially in the stage when pre-series A and then and afterwards where you mostly invest, where the company is preparing to scale globally, these functions, these business functions become even more critical. Um, is it difficult for founders, especially from our region, to adapt, to learn, to develop this new skill set that is necessary? I think it is difficult. It's uh, you know, it's a lot of the times it is uh, related to the skills of the founders, but it's also it, there may be some case for that. But also at the same time, the challenge is very different, right? Mm-hmm. Because uh, as we as we've been discussing, for most of the founders after East, uh, out of Eastern Europe, they need to be thinking about either global market or going to the U.S., right? Mm-hmm. So that's why that effort is actually more more challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the time, you know, if, if a company is an enterprise software business, most of the time founders need to relocate to the U.S. and actually be, 
be the first uh, account executive selling selling really selling the product in the US and mm -hmm. developing the sales methodology mm -hmm. so it is it, it is indeed it is indeed the kind of the uh, the magnitude of challenge is bigger for them mm -hmm. and as well as there is less track record of doing so we mm -hmm. less track record in terms of building building sales organizations it I mean it is it is been improving um, but um, that's a kind of that's that's indeed the challenge. If their founders maybe now listening or, or watching us who would like to bridge this gap for themselves, where can they start? How can you um, prepare for this kind of new challenge in terms of marketing and sales and, and also management? I think managing an organization at uh, you know at this scale is very much different than. Mm -hmm. Uh, being the CEO of a early stage startup. <laughs> yeah, I think you know a lot of the times. I think there is a bit of the naive expectation that uh, you know, uh, it's uh, that this is uh, this is a straightforward process. Is just finding uh, hiring the right person, right salesperson, who would uh, resolve all the sales issues. Right? <laughs> it's, it, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really. It doesn't really work like, like that, right? And especially, you know, when going to the U.S. In the U.S., everybody has a great CV and everybody can sell uh, sell themselves, but you know, not necessarily deliver. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, founders need to kind of realize that actually, the uh, most of the times. Uh, as I mentioned, they are the they, they need to be the first sales executives that actually develops the sales playbook, S develops the sales playbook, develops kind of really narrows down and defines the market uh, to uh, to address, and uh, really kind of develop the sales methodology and uh, and then you know with some with some of the kind of with some proof points only after that. Uh, start hiring salespeople who would actually build upon that. Mm -hmm. But the founders, they are the best know, the best know the, their, their product, the best know uh, how this product is differentiated in the market. And uh, uh, most of the times they are the ones who really need to <laughs> Mm. Need to catalyze the sales in the initial stages. And in the best scenario, they have this also intimate relationship to the market. <laughs> mm. uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, wonder often if um, sales is something uh, that you can develop over time. Is it a skill set that can be uh, learned, or is it uh, a talent that you're born with? I think. Especially in our region, people shy away a bit from from the sales part, um, or have a prejudice of what does it mean to you know uh, actually sell to customers. I think sales, personally, I think that sales can be learned uh, best if you do it, <laughs> you know, uh, by practicing it. Um, I don't know what you observe, but I can definitely support this idea that it is a responsibility of the executive team to uh, you know set the path on a new market and then hire the best possible salespeople uh, to build them upon that that's my experience as well indeed so indeed so and you know what we are most interested in is actually not about you know let's hire the salesperson with the best sales skill, best sales track record. What's most important for us is to build a repeatable process, right? Really, mm. it's all about the kind of re repeatable process, scalable process. Do you s expect to see that before you invest in a company? You mm. know, to see these playbooks developed on uh, um, the different. No, not 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 necessarily. What we want to see, uh, what we want to see. Before it is, we want to understand really the value that uh, the product brings to the customers. Right? Mm -hmm. Really understanding uh, kind of the customer life value and uh, how the customers perceive that technology. How does it uh, helps them uh, address their problems? Mm -hmm. And uh, with the with the sales, most you know, kind of with the sales scale up is most of the time that's something that we work with the founders. Mm -hmm. um, Silicon Valley has been up, up until now uh, the ecosystem that is given more like an example for all the innovation ecosystems that we have in the world. But we see now more and more often that uh, you cannot just copy paste the model and uh, bring it to Singapore or to Bangalore or, you know, the other hubs that uh, are currently developing in the world. And I think the same goes to Central and Eastern Europe. And still, is there something that you think we can adopt from 
the culture in in the Silicon Valley or um, the ways that the ecosystem has been built here in our region? Yes, I think you know as, as we spoke. I think the um, oh, yeah the risk risk tolerance. I think that's something that uh, mm-hmm. that uh, kind of. Uh, you know, really going going after the big big outcomes. I mm. think that's kind of what risk tolerance is about. Is and I guess this applies not only to founders but also to investors. Indeed, so, indeed yeah. so. Yes. It is. Yeah. It, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you know, like really, um, yeah, and you know, being maybe as well as you know, Silicon Valley is an enormous ecosystem, right? And. Mm. Uh, uh, it's uh, you know you would go to the coffee shop and you see uh, you see people doing investments and you know closing deals, partnerships, uh, acquisitions, and uh, you know and the, there is an open open sharing, right? Open sharing uh, of the ideas of the uh, you know oftentimes helping each other without any expectations of benefit in return. So that's something that as well I think. Um, that would would be good to see across across Eastern Europe, but it's more difficult because it's quite much more dispersed market. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, I think the 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 Eastern European market is actually probably the fastest growing venture capital investment markets, so, at least in Europe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Europe has been producing steadily unicorns, and I think we surpassed. China last year? No, no, 2021, right? I'm not so sure. It's a vanity metric, so I don't remember it too, <laughs> too well. I think, but yes, uh, I think I think in 2021, indeed, the uh, the, 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 the has been indeed the uh, observation that number of unicorns exceeded mm-hmm. in Europe than China. But I think it is reflection of the two points, right? One is that was a year of the peak uh, peak growth, tech growth. In Europe specifically, right? Yes. Uh, and at the same time, this was the year when what's called uh, tech crackdown started in China, right? Mm. So in China, the government's really, you know, the government really started imposing antitrust issues, uh, started imposing uh, new regulation. Mm. Uh, a lot of the companies actually, a lot of the companies' valuation deflated substantially. So I think it is it is both reflection of the peak peak in Europe and at the same time quite a challenging environment in China that, that specifically that that year. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe it's an outlier year. <laughs> yeah, not necessarily showing a trend. Um but still, do you think that Europe has maybe greater potential in certain verticals uh where we should I don't know, maybe profile a bit more? Do you see that happening or not yet? I think, you know, Europe, Europe ecosystem is obviously is, uh, has grown a lot and it offers actually in terms of the growth a lot yet to come, right? mm. a lot yet to come. And Europe has always been very strong on the technical side. So yeah. that, that will continue. And I do believe kind of the opportunities in Europe, uh, they're much more interesting uh, than elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, Specifically on the uh, capital efficiency, right? There's been a recent study, uh, which actually I think it was by McKinsey in 21, which actually looked at the um, revenue generated per or uh, per equity dollar invested, mm-hmm. and uh, not just Europe came up much better than the U.S., but Eastern Europe actually came up as the as the highest kind of highest metric and. Yeah, I think the potential of Europe will continue to be to be very strong. Uh, of course, right now we are in, in an environment where there is a lot of the investments being done in artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. And that's something today that in terms of the amount of capital deployed, I would think that uh, US and China probably had versus Europe. Yeah. Um, are the verticals where you, you personally are more, more excited to uh, invest in or um to learn about yeah i think that kind of really what is, we are what is your passion yeah we are right <laughs> now in the in the vintage of ai ai adoption in terms of mm-hmm. ai technology adoption that's that's a vintage it's uh you know if we look at the uh, global economies uh, 
hundred hundred trillion. I think the exact number is probably kind of ninety ninety. Well, close number ninety three trillion. But the AI is also a very broad definition. Yes, but uh, you know <laughs> what, what I wanted to say. What yeah. I want to say is that two third of that uh, two third of that uh, global economy mm-hmm. is sectors like healthcare, education, manufacturing. They've seen re- relatively uh, low penetration of technology, right? Mm-hmm. And I think the artificial intelligence is something that is actually will you know driving the next stage of software growth, really digitalizing those two sectors. Okay, so this is where you see the category defining potential for molten, right? Indeed, yeah. and that's something actually that most of the investors in this market uh, f- focusing on. This is something. This is a secular trend which will, you know, transit through any kind of uh, market downturn. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. What about Web three? <laughs> yes, web three. Web, yeah, I think Web three yeah. is Web three is is an interesting category. This is something that we're looking at that and continue continue investing investing into and it is it is indeed it is a different it's a different architecture uh, mm-hmm. of the web but I think the uh, the interesting thing of the artificial intelligence today it pervades through every uh, every stack right mm-hmm. it pervades through every stack every changes all the categories and I would personally think it is much bigger opportunity mm-hmm. <laughs> interesting <laughs> at the end maybe I can ask you something which refers a bit to us, um, the recursive. We do try to give a bit more insight in what is happening in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, I'm happy that uh, you reached out to us and uh, give us a sign that you will be in Sofia so that we can also do this podcast. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure. But is there something that you would wish that we do or report about a bit more consistently uh, so that we can be helpful to other investors? like uh, you who are based in outside of the region <laughs> what can we do better to I think you? Yeah, I think yeah. I think I think the interesting thing it is you do uh, you do approach uh, kind of this Eastern Europe as a single thing mm. I think that's 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 really interesting and helpful mm. because indeed a lot of the a lot of the kind of uh, challenges that founders are facing they are similarly across Eastern European countries so mm. that's something I think is indeed uh, is indeed uh, kind of that approach is very helpful mm. for us and for the ecosystem, yeah. and uh, really you know letting letting the uh, letting the uh, ecosystem know the the companies come out of the region. I think that's something very uh, very helpful and noble. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, if there is something that we can do better, you can still ping me. <laughs> it doesn't have to be public. Uh, but we are also here to serve and we see ourselves as an ecosystem um, kind of uh, born and community born project. So uh, as long as we deliver value to the ecosystem, the better it is. And one of the approaches is, of course, to maybe build a bit more, uh, a better brand for CE. That's uh, Indeed. what no. we see <laughs> here. Um, thank you so much, Patron. Thank you. Thank it you for was, having me. Uh, thank you for giving us the sign that you are in Sofia and that we would uh, that we had this opportunity to talk in person. Um, I hope we will see you a bit more often here, not only in definitely. Sofia but um, in general. <laughs> Indeed, definitely. <laughs> yes. Uh, if someone wants to get in touch with you, what is the best way? <laughs> uh, you can email me, you know, bachromesmolten.vc or yeah. you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So you're responsive there too. And uh, you would be looking for founders who have uh, an intimate relationship to the market. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but also category defining ideas and global ambitions. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Next on the recursive podcast, Lavinia Mehedinzu co-founder of the social learning platform of Beat. And there are two dimensions here. First, how aware am I of what I need to learn to become better? Mm -hmm. And how aware am I of what the company needs for me to learn, you know? Mm -hmm. And just throwing money at people, um, in my opinion, it's not the best way of doing things because we are in an era of information overload. Right, so it's really hard to choose. And we've seen many companies having those learning stipends that you mm-hmm. mentioned that just are not used no. because people don't know what to choose. So, you know, companies giving clarity about where where we are heading and 
what our skills and our competencies need to, to be, what we need to learn, and then matching that vision with my personal strategy as an individual, mm -hmm. what I would like to learn and where I, I feel I'm, I can perform best, raising that awareness for people, I think that's the best way to, to do things. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.